Good morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome to King's Church. We are so excited and honored that you would spend your Sunday morning with us. So we want to see what church looks like in your home. Take a pic of what you're doing, share it online, and tag us at King's Church KC. Here's what you can expect from today. Here in a little bit, we're going to jo go join our friends over at Jubilee Church St. Louis, and they're going to lead us in a song of worship. After that, we have some news and updates. Next, we actually get to celebrate a baptism together, which is a huge deal. Then finally, we're going to hear a word of encouragement from the Bible, all in about 30 minutes. Yeah. Don't forget, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, we want you to hit that share button. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there that could use a message of hope, and this could be the very thing that they need to hear. So, with that being said, let's worship. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest phrase, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within Sure on Christ. 
Christ my Savior, it is well with my soul. You are the rock on which I stand by your grace. It is well, my hope is sure on Christ my Savior. Yes, God, we thank you. We thank you that because of your love and your grace and your mercy, we can say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Thank you, Jesus. You are the rock on which we stand, the firm cornerstone on which the foundation of our faith is built, and you will never fail. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen. Well, hey, I'm here with Austin, and Austin committed his life to following Jesus at our Easter service. And so we've been waiting for this moment for about a month now. We're so excited to baptize Austin today. If you're new to Christianity, baptism is a physical symbol of a deep spiritual reality. And that is that when Austin goes down into the water, he's declaring that through faith in Jesus, Jesus has forgiven his sins and washed them away, and that his old life is gone. When he comes up out of the water, he's declaring that through faith in Jesus, through, through the death and the resurrection power of Jesus, Austin has a new life with Jesus that he will live forever. So, Austin, man, I couldn't be more excited for you in this moment in your life. If you want to take a moment to share your story with us, and, and then I'm going to man, have the honor of baptizing you today. So let's listen to Austin's story. Prior to Christ, I was a normal kid from small town Missouri who enjoyed playing sports, hunting, and fishing without giving much thought to Jesus. I was invited to multiple churches by multiple friends and usually attended one or two services before I stopped attending. I never considered myself a church person. Although I believed in God, I found it much easier to turn my life away from Him. Fast forward to March 2020. My friend Sarah, whom I met in engineering school, asked me where I was at with my faith. I told her, um, I believe in God, but I've not been saved or baptized, if that's what you're asking. A few days later, UMKC closed its campus went to online classes due to COVID-19, and I thought I had dodged the Jesus talk from Sarah. Then I received a text from her, and I was hoping she would ask, she was just asking for help on homework like usual. The text read, hey, for real, do you want to read the book of John, the Bible one, together and talk about it or something? I was formulating the nicest way to say no, but I couldn't put the text together, and before I knew it, we had daily Zoom sessions set up, because of COVID-19, of course, to do a Bible study. After reading and discussing the amazing works of Jesus, and specifically the miraculous catch of fish, I told you I like fishing, and John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, I knew that Jesus was my Savior and committed my life to following Him. Today I am being baptized to publicly declare that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and to display my wholehearted belief that He died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. I want everyone to receive the gift of salvation and to experience God's grace as I have. Making the decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ and accepting Him to be my Savior was the best decision I have ever made, and I am so grateful to have a God who is loving, forgiving, and eternal. Well, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, hey, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to start by thanking some people, those who give to King's Church week in and week out. I just want you to know your giving is making a huge impact. Uh, we've, we've already given $1,500 
to help feed families in need in our city who are really struggling in this crisis. We're, we're in the process of putting together $1,800 worth of hygiene kits for kids in our city who can't afford basic needs like toothpaste and other essentials. In addition to that, if, if you're not aware, COVID-19 is uh, crushing the economy in some places overseas. And we have uh, over 90 churches and our family of churches over in India. And uh, those churches are, are suffering in an incredible way. Some, some of the pastors have told us that they're literally living off of a diet of salt and rice. And through our Confluence family of churches with other churches, together we've been able to give $15,000 to provide relief to those pastors and those churches. So thank you so much for what you're giving. It, it is making a huge difference, not only in our city, but, but literally it's touching the world. And also, if you're looking for a community to connect with here in Kansas City, we'd love to connect with you. So send us a text at that phone number on the screen. We'll get you connected to this life-giving church. I tell you, this community is incredible. I thank God for it. Uh, it if you're anything like me, you struggle to pray, which is why I just want to jump into this message. And if you missed the last two weeks' messages, let me tell you, they're incredible. Uh, Tim Chambers, pastor of Christ Church in Joplin, and Jerron Scott, pastor at the same church, shared messages about learning to pray like a child, which that posture of prayer will change everything for you. And then Jerron shared a message about learning to hear God, which if you didn't catch those, go back, listen to those five times until it sticks. I know I'm going to because it really was that good. I'm titling this message, What to Say when you pray. What to say when you pray. I don't know about you, but when I pray, oftentimes I feel like I'm going back to the gym for the first time. Remember that first time I went to the gym, not only was it difficult to get in the door the first time, not only just lack of motivation and insecurity, but once I was in the door, I quickly realized I didn't know what to do. And I'm looking around at all these people who are in shape, who clearly know what they're doing, and I'm thinking, I don't want them to know that I don't have a clue what I'm doing. So I just went to what seemed the most familiar, which was the treadmill. And got on the treadmill and I realized, yeah, I don't want to push it so hard that I'm literally on the floor in 10 minutes, but I also don't want to take it so easy that I look like I'm as out of shape as I really am. So I got on the treadmill and I tried to kind of fake it till I make it. Well, that's how often I feel in prayer. Not only is it hard to get to the place of prayer, but once I'm there, I'm like, man, what do I do? How do I pray? And what I love is that the disciples of Jesus Christ, those who walked with him for three and a half years as he walked the earth, felt the exact same way. They saw the power of the prayer ministry of Jesus, and, and they asked a simple but bold question. They said, Jesus, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us how to pray like you pray. And, and Jesus gives this simple yet powerful form of prayer. Matter of fact, this form of prayer is a form of prayer that you can use at any time, in any place, in any situation, in any season of your life. You can use it when you're praying for three minutes. You can use it when you're praying for 30 minutes. This form of prayer, if you'll use it, will not only help you how to know how to pray, it will posture your prayers to be prayers of faith and prayers that are effective. And so I'm just going to jump right in. you got to love Jesus' response. I mean, if you've seen that show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Jesus knew the answer was no. He knew that he had to bring it down to kindergarten level for his disciples and for us. And so he doesn't give a complicated, mysterious form of prayer. No, no. He, he gets right to the point. He says, when you pray, say this literally gives us a script. So let's jump in. What does he say? He says, when you pray, say this. And he starts with this incredible word. It's the word Father. Father. He says, when you pray, say this, Father. Jesus knows that our position creates our posture. He knows that our position creates our posture. Jeff Bezos, richest man in the world, CEO of Amazon, I think his net worth is $147 billion. If he invited me to Amazon headquarters, my posture would be a little bit different than if I just went as a tourist. Why? Because my position, my relationship with Jeff would change my posture to act differently as I walked around. My daughter, when she wakes up, she wants to snuggle me. I tell you what, I love those morning snuggles with my daughter. Why does she do that? Well, she doesn't do that for everyone. She does that for me because my relationship with her as her dad creates her posture as that of a daughter. And she loves time with her dad. Listen, your, your posture towards God directly is directly related to how you view your position. Jesus says you're no longer servants, you're sons. He says you're no longer beggars, you're his beloved. And many of us have a distorted view of God. And actually, we have a distorted view of what a father is as well. And Jesus wants to change that view for us. He, he wants to change the way we view God. He wants to change the way we view that word father because he says that God is a good father who loves to give good gifts 
to his children. He's a faithful father. He, he's a father whose love endures forever. And that's the kind of father he wants to be in your life. And the greatest gift Jesus tells the father gives is his own presence through the person of the Holy Spirit. So every time you pray, start like this. Say, Father. And then after you pray that, say, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. I don't know about you, but hallowed is not a word I use all the time. I'm not walking around like, hey, man, hallow the chief. You know, hallow. No, I don't do that. I, it's not a word in our vocabulary. So I'm going to break it down for you. Hallowed simply means to honor as holy. And that word holy, it simply means set apart. So, so when you pray, God, hallowed be your name, you're saying, God, I want to view your name as so great and so awesome and so set apart and so other that there's no one that I give the, the amount of affection and adoration and praise to as you. There's, there's no one that I ascribe so much worth and value to in my life as to you, God. And this is really the heart of true worship is that we revere and we treasure God's name. And if you begin your prayer times by praying, God's name be hallowed. I'll say it this way. If you begin your prayers with praise instead of with your problems, all of a sudden you're going to realize your problems look much smaller and your praise is going to be much larger. Why? Not because your problems went away, but because when you get a view of an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God who is your father, all of a sudden you realize he can change your situation. He can change your problems in a moment. It's not a thing for him. And if, if he's letting them still exist in your life, maybe he's working something good through it. Jesus continues. He says, your kingdom come. It's important to understand if you're a Christian, this is fundamental to our view of God is that God is a king. That's why we named it King's Church. And, and Jesus, when he came, the essence of his message was the kingdom of God has come. He was saying, I'm the king and everywhere I go, my kingdom is coming with me. And so when he healed the sick, when he preached good news, when he brought justice to injustice in the world, he, he was saying, this is the kingdom of God on display. And his kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness, which is right relationship with God and people. It's a kingdom of peace and it's a kingdom of joy. If you want righteousness, right relationship with God and people in your life, if you want peace in your life, if you want joy in your life, then we should be praying, God, your kingdom come on a regular basis. And when things in our world happen, so Ahmaud Arbery, I heard about the murder of Ahmaud Arbery and my heart was broken. I didn't know how to respond, but what I did know is I needed to pray, God, your kingdom come. Because in, God, in God's kingdom, there is justice for the oppressed. In God's kingdom, there, there is the potential to heal and change generations of racism, systematic racism. God's kingdom is the hope to change those things. In God's kingdom, there's true unity. Listen, diversity is cheap. D diversity is a bunch of different colors in a room. That's easy. You can get that at a Chiefs game. Unity is Unity only comes by the kingdom of God. Unity is what we see in Revelation chapter 7, where you have every tribe and every tongue or language and every people group and every nation gathered around the throne of God. So the, the, the greatest diversity you've ever seen in the world, Revelation chapter 7, every kind of person there is on the earth, they're gathered around the throne of God and, and their differences don't change. Actually, their differences are celebrated. I love that scripture celebrates our differences. God is not colorblind. Because color is not a bad thing. Color is beautiful. No, no, the, the scriptures, they celebrate our differences. And yet in Christ, we can have true unity. We can have love and peace and joy and harmony. Actually, what we see in Revelation 7 is all these people with one united heart and one united voice declaring salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Jesus came declaring the kingdom of God. It's the essence of his message. And yet we know that the kingdom of God has not fully come. We know that there's still injustice, there's still evil, there's still sickness, there's still pain, there's still death in our world. So we've seen his kingdom come when he came, and we're praying his kingdom come, and one day it will fully come at the judgment day of Jesus. And if, if you're not aware, the judgment day of Jesus is where every person will stand before Jesus Christ, and we will be judged for our life. And those who have trusted in Jesus for forgiveness and life in his name will forever be brought into a relationship with God. We'll forever live in a new heaven and a new earth with new bodies. There will be no more sickness and death and pain, evil and justice in our world. And those who have rejected the gift of Jesus will be forever separated from God and punished for their sins. And as followers of Jesus, it's our responsibility to stand in the gap. It's our responsibility to pray his kingdom come and live a kingdom life to where the world can taste and see that God is good and that he is Lord of all. 
Jesus continues, says, give us each day our daily bread. You might have prayed this more in the last two months than you have the last 10 years as you're looking at the bills stack up and you're looking at the economy go down and you're, you're wondering what's going to happen with your life. You may have been praying, God, help me provide for my needs. God, help us pay these bills. And this is an amazing prayer to pray, but let's put it in perspective. Let's put it in its right place because if you, pray, if you start your prayers with praise, you'll have faith to pray for provision. If, if you start your prayers just with prayers for provision, you, you probably won't get to praise. A little tip, before you ask for what you need, give thanks for what you already have. And one of the things I do in my life is just start my prayer times by thanking God for the simple things in life. God, thank you for the roof over my head. Thank you for the food in my stomach. Thank you for the clothes on my back. Thank you for the provision in my life. All of a sudden, as I pray those things, I begin to have faith for the provision that he wants to give next. Take note, this prayer is connected to a promise. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They neither, they, they don't work, they don't sow, they don't reap, but God provides for their needs. He feeds them. He says, look at the lilies of the field. They're more splendid than Solomon in all of his glory. If you don't know about Solomon, Solomon was the richest and wisest king to ever live. He was doped out with some good clothes. And God says, look at the lilies of the field. They're even more beautiful than Solomon in all of his glory. Jesus finished. He says, if you seek first the kingdom of God, God will provide for all your needs. Put God first. Honor him with your life and your wealth, and he will provide for you. You can't expect God's provision if you won't believe his promise. But if you do, and if you pray for his provision, he will provide for every need that you have. Jesus continues, he says, forgive our sins. Catch this, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. The structure of that statement is huge. Forgive our sins, for we have forgiven others. Forgive us according to, in the same way that we have forgiven others. Jesus expands on this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 to 15. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive yours. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespass. It's as simple as this. If we refuse forgiveness to others, God will refuse forgiveness to us. Jesus tells a story in Matthew 18 to really drive it home with Peter. Peter's a little thick-headed like me. Sometimes he struggles to get it. And Jesus tells him this story to, to help him see how important this is. And he says, Peter, imagine a servant owed a king 10,000 talents. And if you're not familiar with a talent, you know, I don't, I don't deal in talents every day. I deal in dollars. A talent, 10,000 talents is equivalent to $6 billion. Jesus says that represents our sin against God. We owe a debt we could never repay. Jesus says that's the reality of our life. Yet God the King in His love and His mercy for us has forgiven our debt and set us free from the prison that we deserved. Jesus says, okay, that's the picture. Now imagine someone owed you $10,000 or 100 denarii and you refused forgiveness to them. Jesus says, if that's the story, if, if a king has forgiven you $6 billion and you refuse forgiveness for $10,000, then actually that king's going to take you and put you back in prison. You're going to become a slave to your own unforgiveness. And God says, this is the picture of someone who has received the forgiveness of God, but won't give the forgiveness of God to others. One pastor said, choosing not to forgive is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. For many of us, it's, it's the daily offenses of a spouse or a boss or a roommate. We need to keep short accounts and quickly forgive. For others, it's horrible things that have been done to us. Massive injustice in our lives, evil things that have been committed against us. And God doesn't overlook those things. God says that He, is, he provides justice for the oppressed, that that day will come. But that does not justify our unforgiveness towards them. God commands us to release them from the debt, to walk out of the spiritual prison. We have let them put us in to forgive as God has forgiven us. And I just want to make an invitation to you. If you have never received the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in your life, if you've never called upon him as your Lord and your Savior, if you've never said, Jesus, please forgive me and give me a new life with you, I want to invite you to take that step today. And it's as simple as believing that he is who he said he was, that, that he died for your sins, that he rose from the dead, and that he is the only hope for your forgiveness and your life. If you want to pray that prayer today, simply repeat after me wherever you are. You can say it in your head or you can say it out loud. Jesus, I believe you are God's son. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And three days later, you rose from the dead. Please forgive me for all my sins. 
please give me a new life with you. I commit my life to following you, so please fill me with your Holy Spirit to live the life you created me for. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, we are celebrating with you. We're thrilled for your new life in God, and we want to help you however we can. So send us a text to that number. You can say connect. You can say gave my life to Christ. You can say whatever you want, but send us a text. We'd love to help you get started in your faith journey. Before you go, everyone else, I just want to pray for you. Jesus finishes this prayer time, this little form of prayer, and he says, lead us not into temptation. Believe it or not, there is an enemy of our soul constantly working to pull us away from God and destroy our lives, but God has not left us alone. He will never leave you, and if you simply ask him, he will step in to help you and to give you victory every single day, to, to live your life as David prays in Psalm 27, 4, where he says, God, I want to spend all my days in your presence, seeing your beauty, hearing your voice. That's what I believe God wants for your life. And so I just want to pray for you before we go that, that we would learn to pray like Jesus, that we would learn to live in his presence and see his beauty and hear his voice. So Father, I thank you for every single person under the sound of my voice. God, I pray that they would know your presence. They would see your beauty. They would hear your voice. God, I pray, would you teach us to pray? Let us just recite that every day this week. Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus, would you give us confidence to come as children? We have a Father that loves us and loves to give us good gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. As always, if this encouraged you or helped you in any way, be sure to find that share button, send it to a friend, and we'll see you next Sunday at 10 a.m.